All right, great. So we should be recording now. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on, I guess, where you are. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Wes Barefoot. I'm the Director of Franchise Development for Shelf Genie. Uh, thank you for joining us for another of our weekly uh, Franchise Partner Spotlight calls. Uh, the purpose of these calls is to give anyone that's interested in learning more about the Shelf Genie Franchise Opportunity uh, a chance to hear from a different one of our franchise partners each week. And um, I, I like to kind of kick these calls off by giving a, a brief introduction of the, the franchise partner that we have on this week and, uh, and then kind of have them tell a little bit of their background and, and what they did prior to joining Shelf Genie. And then, uh, of course, share some of their experience since joining Shelf Genie. And as we go through our discussion today, we'll have plenty of opportunity for Q&A. Um, and then I'll have some questions for you, Joseph, to kind of, you know, fill in any gaps that we may have. But looking forward to a, a great conversation today um, with Joseph Choi, um, who is our franchise partner in Vancouver, uh, up in Canada. And uh, as you see here, here's just kind of some, some brief background information on Joseph. I'll uh, try not to steal too much of his thunder, but uh, Joseph's been with us since May of 2014 as a franchise partner, and uh, he's served on our Franchise Advisory Council uh, and was also the president of our Franchise Advisory Council, which is really uh, just a group of five to six different franchise owners that meet on a regular basis with our leadership team in the home office and are very instrumental in you know, kind of helping us determine the direction of the brand going forward. Uh, you can see Joseph served on some other committee, uh, committees since joining Shelf Genie uh, and, and had some, some awards along the way as well. So um, Joseph's been very instrumental and a big part of the Shelf Genie community ever since joining. And uh, I'm excited to, to have you on today, Joseph. I appreciate you taking some time to speak with us. Thanks very much, Wes. Uh, uh, hi, Craig. Hi, everyone. Um, it's quite timely that I'm doing this call because it was actually five years ago around this time that I was doing my own phone calls with uh, other franchisees and, and doing my own due diligence as far as uh, getting to know Shelf Genie and how it may, might impact my life as far as uh, where, where I could take it and, and change my career basically is, is kind of where, where it all stemmed from. Um, I was kind of in transition as far as what I was going to do. I came from an investment background for about 18 years. Uh, I was good at what I did. I liked what I did. I could never say I loved what I did. I think that's what really prompted me to kind of find out, you know, look out there, you know, what's out there for me? Can I make a, a, an entirely different career change? Was that even an option? Uh, There's a lot of questions that, you know, I was, I was going through in my head. And, uh, you know, during that journey, I, I, I came across a franchise broker, had a great conversation as far as, uh, you know, what, what my options could be. And, and uh, they're, they're the top five franchises that were offered up to me. And, and the franchise broker said to me, okay, I got this fifth one for you. And it, it might be a dark horse, but I think you might like it. Uh, and it's called Shelf Genie. Uh, and the reason why he mentioned it that way was because I was looking for, I gave you some criteria as far as what I was looking for. Uh, number one, uh, I was looking for a niche market, uh, something that was very unique, obviously, uh, and uh, something that hasn't really been, um, you know, the, the ground hasn't been dug yet necessarily uh, on, on this market. And that was quite unique to me when I, when I first heard about it. And quite frankly, I never heard about pull-ups or pull-up shelves, glide-up shelves, any of those kind of key words that we use now. So but mean, it was, you, uh, mean you didn't grow up aspiring to, to own a custom glide-out shelving business? Is that <laughs> what you're saying? I, I know what wood is, uh, but that was probably, probably about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but... But I, I think in my gut, I think that fifth one, when that franchise broker uh, mentioned that to me, I think in my gut, I just went, wow, like that's, that was quite intriguing. And, and I think, um, you know, out of my entire spidey senses with the, the, the five franchises that were, were thrown at me, I think this one was the one where I just went, yeah, I think there might be some possibilities. So, so anyways, um, as I mentioned, around this time, uh, you know, just got to, to meet some of the folks at Shelf Genie, um, you know, asked a lot of questions. Uh, and more importantly was was to talk to the people who were already in the system uh, as franchisees. And I thought that was very important for me to really understand the, the true color of the business, if you want to call it that. You know, the successful folks, the, the ones who were just starting up. Just, again, the, the full spectrum of kind of where, where, where some of those folks were at and what made them tick. Uh, and, and it wasn't really until I went to, uh, I flew to Atlanta that uh, it, it really gave me a better sense of 
you know, what the business was about. Really meeting the people face to face really mattered to me. Um, and I, and because in, in my mind was like, is this, uh, you know, just some little small office, you know, uh, cardboard boxes all over the place, or is this actually something that is um, legitimate? And, uh, and, and luckily enough, it was very legitimate. <laughs> Um, the folks there uh, in Atlanta were just fantastic people, great people to work, um, just get to know, uh, almost felt like family in a way, um, you know, and, and, and they want you to be successful. And I think that was really important for me is that, you know, they had my, uh, you know, their hand to my back as far as, you know, the support that they were going to provide. And I, I think that helped me a lot in knowing that, you know, they had the tools, they had the systems in place uh, to take you from start to finish in the process. And I'm talking about the sales process. And that was very important knowing that, you know, it, it, it wasn't just some makeshift type of system. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, coming from not just an investment background, but I have a technology background as well. And I built systems too. Uh, I was quite impressed with uh, the, you know, the, the system that they had that again, with kind of very A to Z, soup to nuts, you know, you don't have to rebuild anything type of solution. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a bit of context, hopefully in terms of, you know, how, how I got started off the ground. Uh, and maybe Wes, if you want to lead any, lead on any other questions, I guess I can kind of keep going if you like. Yeah, no, that was, that was a great, um, kind of start and introduction and congratulations on your five year anniversary coming up. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I did see that Sharon, uh, Kemp has joined us. Sharon, welcome. Uh, and thanks for taking some time. So Sharon was actually with us in Atlanta earlier this week. We had to join the team day uh, going on. So um, appreciate you taking the time to to jump on here, Sharon. Um, so, you know, it, you talked a little bit about, you know, kind of what attracted you to, to Shelf Genie, um, you know, kind of coming out of the corporate world. You know, maybe talk a little bit about uh, just kind of what the typical – you know, day to day looks like for you? I think that's a, a question that a lot of people, you know, evaluating uh, sure. any franchise opportunity have is what is your, your kind of typical day to day look like? Yeah, that's, a, I think that's a really good question. Because, um, you know, depending, I think, I think depending on where you are in the business kind of dictates how many hours you might be spending. Um, I, you know, just like any other business it does have to be shelf it can be any type of business. I mean, you have to roll up your sleeves and start understanding the business quite well. Uh, one of my goals uh, as an owner was uh, that I wanted to be one of the best designers. And when I say best designer, I want to be uh, an expert in, in terms of my business so that when I hire people, I want to be able to lead my team up front, if that makes sense. Um, right. I, I don't want you know, anybody to, uh, you know, I want my team to be very proficient. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I want them to see that, hey, you know what? I see my, the leader or the owner um, being the mentor. And I want to mentor my entire team. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's who I am, I think. Um, and, and so anyways, uh, the, the amount of time I spent up front uh, was a lot. Um, you know, the training was a lot where, you know, I was looking for specific people who I felt, um, not the car salesman per se, but people who actually cared about um, you know, loving what I saw in the business. And if they could articulate to me that I love this business because, or I, like the information I sent them, they digested it and they can sense of what I sense about the business. I thought there might be a good fit there. And so building a team was number one, uh, very important. So I spent a lot of time focusing on that. Uh, and then number two was really getting out there and spreading the word or the gospel or however you want to say it. But really um, it's because it's such a, because it was such a niche market at that time, uh, I had to just get out there, networking, yeah. uh, networking functions, uh, joining the chamber of commerce, yep. uh, and again, uh, get on social media, get those likes going on Facebook. So there's, you know, you have to be kind of, you start learning stuff, uh, which is pretty awesome uh, on the marketing front. Uh, and there's so many different marketing avenues uh, that we have now than that, that we didn't have before. Uh, obviously, right. uh, you know, the internet, social media are, are, are a big component uh, of our business and always growing on that front. Uh, and then, again, just meeting people and developing relationships so you can build these referral, uh, hopefully some referral funnels as well. Uh, and, and so, you know, you're kind of uh, an octopus at that point in time. And I think I'm pretty sure I, I, uh, I worked a lot of hours. Um, I don't I don't count the hours. I have to say I didn't really track it that way. Uh, I just knew what I needed to do to get up and running. So booking trade shows, um, hiring people to help at the trade shows, um, 
finding your designer installer uh, and getting to know the Shelf Genie system especially. I think once you get to know the system um, and you see all the stuff that they've built for us as franchisees, the training manuals, uh, how to um, you know, uh, coach your designers and installers, uh, all those things, I think when you become good at something and it shows, people want to follow you. Or when you're, you're at a client's home and you're trying to do a design and, you, and they see the passion, just like yesterday, I got a $7,000 sale yesterday. And the person said to me, wow, you really love your job. Like you, you can see it. And I said, yeah, I can tell you. Like I, I liked what I did in my past uh, in the investment industry, but I never said I could love what I do. And there's a big difference when you, you can have a business or whatever you're doing and you can really enjoy it and make someone's life turn out to be pretty awesome because you can see what the, what the outcome is going to be when you finish the installation. And she gave me, a, she gave me, I told my wife this just yesterday. She gave me a big hug. She, she goes, can I, can I give you a hug? Uh, this client said to me, and it was just the nicest thing. And it just happened yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and it was very touching. It, it doesn't happen all the time, but obviously when you can really touch someone and then, and then she said, you know what? I want to book you in for a phase two in two weeks. So even before we go in on the install, she wants me to take a look at other parts of her home as well it was just the that's awesome the neatest yeah. well and, and she'll be a client for life and and likely have you know referrals for you in the future and and she'll you know become a raving fan of of shelf genie because of that passion that she was able to see in you right exactly and and it just so so as i mentioned at the beginning when as a franchisee you know yeah you you are you know i'm i've, I've slugged out that first year yeah you kind of have to just like any other business but as time went on my goal was to build a team so that my team would do the vast majority of my sales. Uh, and my job is to try and uh, generate appointments or, or you know, op opportunities for my team so that they would stick with me for the long term. So you know, the first three people I've hired uh, uh, five years ago are still with me to this day and they're my core team. That's great. And again, you're, if you find those people that will be with you for the long term, it saves so much time from having the energy to tr retrain and retrain and having that turnstile of people coming in and out. So absolutely. So, yeah. So now, I mean, like now, like, you know, you know, three, four years ago, my, my time started to um, like, I still hustle. Don't get me wrong, but the, the amount of time I spend in terms of what I can do now, you know, I, I joined Toastmasters. I'm part of a chamber of commerce economics committee, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I'm just doing all these things. I, I've been to all my, my daughter's uh, field trips uh, all this time. It's been pretty awesome that way. And you get to pick and choose what you want to do. Uh, but obviously, if I can sleep well at night knowing that my team is out there and doing the job correctly, and obviously I'm not going to, I don't have to micromanage them, you know, it, it, it is quite turnkey as far as, you know, making this business hum. Yeah, and I think you hit on, you know, one of the key things that I really try to stress with, with any of the candidates that I'm working with is that, you know, your time as an owner is best spent working on developing the team. I mean, we really, you know, like to talk about it in terms of working on the business instead of in the business. And if you do it correctly, right. as you've done, you know, you end up with a business that's working for you instead of you having to, to put in all of the work. And, and it's not that you're not still working hard you you are working hard but you're able to you know at that point once you do have a very strong team in place you're able to work a little more strategically and kind of focus on the higher level bigger picture aspect of it and and that typically comes with a little more flexibility as well which i think is what a lot of people are looking for when they're considering getting into business for themselves right exactly and, and that's exactly it i mean um, i mean that my thing was when when i uh, first looked at shelf genie was it envisioning what my outcome was would be and my first thought was having a laptop near a beach in hawaii right able to do some work uh close that laptop and then hit the water <laughs> absolutely uh, and, you know and, and when i'm able to visualize like that then i work myself backwards as far as what i need to do to be able to fulfill that and again be able to sleep well at night knowing that the business is still running but i have the people that i can trust that can run that business yeah. So, and this is all good stuff that you're sharing. I want to maybe unpack a little bit of it and, and focus on a couple things that you mentioned. So um, maybe circle back to talking a little bit more about your team, because one of the things I really picked up on was the fact that, you know, your core team has kind of been with you since day one and you're coming up on five years now. So I think that's a, a pretty impressive kind of statistic, if you will, and a testament to, 
you know, the culture that you've built within your team. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about where you found those initial designers and installers, which are, are the two components that really make up a, a Shelf Genie uh, team. And, and what have you done along the way to create that culture that's resulted in them, you know, staying with you and really being the type of people that you need to, to have a solid team? Right. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, the, some of these things that I do is, is very deliberate. Um, I mean, uh, you know, there's different managing styles. Um, you can be in a corporate world and having a, a vertical integration as far as top down type management. Uh, I do for a small business, I go horizontal all the way. You know, they, they see me um, setting up a trade show booth. Um, they, they've seen me do installations. They've seen me do designing. I roll up my sleeve just as much as they do. And one of the commitments I have with each and every one of them is that I have my hand to their back to make them successful. And I say that to them, right? That's number one. And, and number two is when I'm looking for people, um, the, the, the first designer I hired, uh, Caroline, uh, I, I lucked out on her in the sense that I just, I just posted on my LinkedIn. I, post, right. I did a post and I said, hey, I'm looking for a designer. I'm starting this business. And it just so happens one of my, one of our mutual friends said, Hey, I think I have somebody for you. And, uh, we went out for lunch, sent her the information and it was just her energy. I think it was, I, I, I feed off people's energy and it was just her level of, again, excitement about, about the business that we're, we're starting up. And luckily, um, I was able to instill a belief system because a start is a startup, right? So right. imagine you joining a company that you're just starting up, like the risk you're taking as an individual in, in seeing where this is gonna go. And so I was painting a vision as far as where I'm gonna take it. And yeah. I remember one of the questions that she asked me was, you know, how long will Shelf Genie last, right, as a business? And I said, hey, that's a really good question. And, I, and my, my quick response was, because I never really thought about it like that, uh, was as long as we're all getting old, we're gonna yeah. need Shelf Genie. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, um, it's so, a fair you know, point. Yeah, unless there's a fountain of youth, um, you know, then, you know, and not saying that's not, it's just for people who are getting older. Obviously, we've, we have a spectrum of clients, but, you know, sure. people who are our target, as you know, Wes, yep. is, you know, people who have, you know, disposable income, and therefore, usually it is an older crowd with different priorities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, that's, 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 so anyways, I found her through LinkedIn. Uh, and then the other two uh, installers, when I first uh, started, uh, I, I just posted on a kind of a, uh, it's called Kijiji. I'm not sure if you have in the States, but it's similar to, let's say Craigslist, you know, was one of those sites. Okay. Uh, and I had about 12 interviews. And uh, ironically, on the day that I um, uh, found these two individuals, I actually interviewed them both on the same day. I just liked their energy. And they, uh, you know, we sent them to Atlanta. Uh, they uh, came back and funny enough, they, uh, they met some in Atlanta during the training where they were a designer learning to be an installer and I think light bulbs hit and they went you know what I want to be a designer as well yeah and so they were trained up as designers as well um, a, you know um, after a few months becoming an installer and so it was great to have what I would call these unicorns who were yeah. a great customer service you know all those kind of qualities that I looked for and to be able to, to um, straddle on both roles which, which yeah. is very hard to that is harder to find, but if you can find someone that can kind of be that, that hybrid, you know, both a designer and an installer, that's, that's fantastic. So, um, you know, talk, maybe talk a little bit about the, cause this is a, a pretty common question because, you know, like I mentioned, I, I really stress with, with candidates as we're working through this process, the importance of, you know, developing a team and how that should be a, a primary focus for an owner, not only starting out, but ongoing. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about the support that you were able to to get from the home office in terms of, you know, how to go about recruiting these designers and installers, how the home office helps with training them um, and any of that. And, and I know it was five years ago. So um, but as, as best as you can, um, maybe kind of give us a recap on that. Sure. Uh, and, and like I said, this is just a timely conversation because, uh, um, you know, if I was to recap quite easily, I mean, it was literally. We're doing these type of calls uh, like we're doing right now, uh, like one-on-one -on -one with franchisees, it, you know, went to Atlanta in May and uh, I, I signed on the dotted line pretty much after our meeting uh, asking, ask, asking if, you know, if I, I could be part of this. And, uh, and then, you know, soon after, the month after that in June, um, they had their annual conference. Mm -hmm. And so it was so timely as far as, you know, getting to know all these franchisees now face-to-face. 
uh, getting to know hopefully some of the lingo. I haven't been trained yet, but at least you get a good sense of the, uh, you want to talk about um, even uh, a franchisee culture, I guess, you know, everyone's right. really friendly. Um, they all knew each other. It was just a really cool community of people uh, was my experience. It was a great conference. Um, and then they were very nice enough to uh, have me stay in Atlanta, given the distance between Vancouver and Atlanta. They, they said, why don't you stay here and we're going to train you up both on the designer installer side as well. So they were so busy decompressing from conference, but they were given, you know, they were amazing to just give me the time to be trained. So by the time uh, end of June hit, I came back to Vancouver and trained up. Uh, and, you know, again, in July was my, my go time in terms of planning things out. And so I used that month of July to plan things out. Um, and you know, uh, uh, throughout that time, you know, I, I had constant communication with head office and the support that they were giving me with any questions that I had, uh, what that I asked. I asked a lot of, uh, asked for help a lot uh, through the franchise community. Um, again, people were just very, just fantastic with being able to answer any questions that I had, because you know, there's there's no use in trying to you know reinvent the wheel if you can find successful people in the system that can help you along the way. So I was looking at. I, I was in the system looking for all the top franchisees uh, and who they were and what made them tick and what made them successful. Yep. And so I was trying to get these golden nuggets of wisdom from each of them and then try to formulate my own, my own thoughts around it. Uh, and then again, one of my goals was to learn to be a great designer. So yeah, I did a lot of practice design appointments, uh, advertised in the newspaper uh, in preparation for my August green light, if you want to call it. Um, that, that's when my business was going to run and got my first appointment August 6th. And then from there, you know, the rest was history. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, and, and, I, and I brought my first designer on in September uh, because I became really pretty profi proficient pretty fast in August. And she came on board in September to start the trade show season with me. Right, and so with the designers, are, are you primarily kind of training new designers yourself and, and then uh, we do now uh, offer a designer training once a month in Atlanta, but it's really positioned as kind of a supplemental training once a designer has started training with their local owner and, and maybe other designers on that team in, in the local market. Um, and then installers come to Atlanta for training. So we, we essentially handle the bulk of the training for new installers. Right. So is that similar to the process that you followed? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the first two installers that I brought on board sent them to Atlanta. Uh, and, and they became really proficient fast, like just, um, and, and so anybody else I brought on board in, in my world anyways, I just had one of my installers provide the hands on, like I sent my, these other installers to, with my other installer to see how it's done. Uh, and then I would provide any, um, I would provide the training on the designer side myself. Uh, and not to say that, it, it, you know, I mean, I think we're, we're pretty, pretty married up as far as what we believe in as far as the design is concerned from a head office to franchisees. So I felt comfortable in training. I've always been a mentor type of person anyway. So that's just, you know, I felt comfortable with it, but obviously having the um, head office offer up these trainings as well is, is very fruitful. I think uh, for other designers to come into head office, get to know the people and then get a better scope of the business as well. Yeah. Well, that's really, really good insight. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone here and uh, open it up for questions. Um, so Craig or Sharon, if you guys have any questions for Joseph uh, based on anything that he's mentioned so far or just anything else in general, uh, feel free to, to go ahead and jump in. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Joseph. This has been um sounds like you've uh, had a great start and a, a great five-year run and, and um, Wes hit on exactly um, what I would like to know more of, and, and so is, is your um, hiring, and, and you said you found someone on LinkedIn. Are you looking for a particular skill set, or is it um, uh, a, an attitude? A, a, you know, it sounds like you're looking for a good fit and not so much um, what they did in the past, a skill set, but, but a, a attitude, personality type. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, just just similar to what I was saying, I guess at the beginning where I didn't know anything about pull-ups or glide-outs, I could easily be trained on that. And just as much as I get to know about our the system with Shelf Genie, you know, uh, these the, the training part I think it, it can be grasped quite easily. But 
you know, to your point, Sharon, about just the attitude, I definitely was looking for the attitude, the energy, the energy that they were excited. They weren't, they weren't coming to these coffee meetings asking me how much they're going to make those. If that was the first question, that was a really bad sign. Uh, in my opinion, if somebody came up to me and said, wow, I really love this shelf genie. I love what it, I love. I've seen the pictures. I love what it can do for people. I love the organization. And when people can articulate what I first believed with why I joined shelf genie, I, I think is a good indicator of somebody that cares. And that's what I look for is people that care, not necessarily somebody that's just going to make a quick buck or a $10,000 sale off of a client. They truly care about the client in terms of what their priori priorities are, what their budgets might be. Um, I, I always say to clients, we don't do a hard sell. If, if, if you just want to do a pantry today, let's do the pantry. Call me six months down the road. Let's see how the dust settles once we finish the install and call me back. When you're that genuine with people, they want to come back to you. And it's not a sales tactic. I truly do care. I do mean that, you know what, let's just see how things settle in with, with the first solution. Uh, and that way you can actually build fans rather than somebody feeling, oh, I spent way too much with this company. That's great. Thanks. Well, and, and what's what's so interesting about that is, you know, the designers that really do care and are really focused on providing the absolute best solution for the client. Those are the designers that are going to typically have that higher close rate and that higher, you know, average sell and, and probably make more than the designer that's going in focused on, all right, how much can I make off of, you know, running this appointment today? Um, you know, they, they really go hand in hand. And so, you know, I would agree in, in our franchise, you know, we uh, absolutely are looking primarily for attitude. Everything else can be taught. Um, attitude's one thing that's really, really difficult to teach uh, or to train. So. Right. Yeah. And in uh -huh. philosophy, I mean, if, if you can instill philosophy with your team in terms of you want to call it a belief system or whatever that is, you know, in terms of why we do what we do uh, and they can go in with that type of attitude, every single design appointment, uh, you know, the, if you want to call it close rates or, you know, success rate, uh, you know, the, the results will show. And I think it really does start with that foundational piece of instilling what as an owner, what your belief systems are with why you do what you do um, with them. Uh, and then, and then like I, as I mentioned, one of my thing is, yeah, like I have my hand to my, my team's back as far as making them successful. I will be there. If you need to text me, send me a text. I will, I will be there to answer that. You know, you always set expectations to know that, Hey, you know what? This guy's not just an owner that sits up on a 20 foot pedestal. You know, right. he's down here, you know, um, you know, if, if I need to bring my installer something or go get it, if, he, if he's in a pinch, I will go get it. I'm going to be a team player. You know, if we all do this as a team, we will make each other successful. So how do you, um, do you have, um, you know, monthly, weekly team meetings? How do you, um, you know, does your installer work closely with your designer? And, and yeah. Can you yeah. Talk about that? Right. That's great. Yeah. That? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so at the beginning, uh, I definitely had uh, monthly calls, uh, very similar to what we're doing with Zoom here. Uh, we did more face-to-face, -face, uh, but given our geography, my geography in Vancouver is very, very west to east. So it's quite a, a, a long distance, but we definitely, um, I want to make sure that the designer, as you mentioned, um, the designer installer relationship is so important. I can't stress that enough. Um, if the designer's not communicating what their design is going to be, uh, obviously that's going to create some angst with the installer. So I want to make sure that the uh, designer uh, can definitely coexist with the installer. And that is by communicating properly, whether it's documenting on the system or whether it's texting or talking on the phone, they have to be a joint to the hip as far as, you know, the whole Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers type of dancing, right? Like it's just so fluid. And when you have that, it's amazing. It's just magic. Uh, they can work on their own. They don't, they don't have, I don't have to be the person in the middle, caught in the middle between a designer and installer. Uh, and so that's a very, that's a really good point, Sharon, about, yeah, um, making sure that the designer and installer uh, relationship is, is, is very, very tight. Okay. And I'm sorry, I missed. How many um, designers and installers do you have? Uh, I have seven designers, uh, four of which are installers. Okay, great. And then I'm the eighth designer, I think. Yeah. So do all of your installers design as well? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's unique, I think. 
It is. Yeah. Be, I, you know what? Like I always stress, you know, if you can be deliberate and trying to find folks who can do both only because it saves a step, you know, uh, if I'm a designer only, then I require my installer to come in to do the official measurements. Well, and they can't, they can make more that way too. So it probably increases the likelihood of them staying with you longer. And that's, exactly. I, I would guess has something to do with the lack of turnover that you've had. That's correct. Exactly. The, all those things. And, and two of my installers are remote. They're about three, four hours away. So, you know, they're not as busy, but obviously, like you said, Wes, if you can do both, you definitely make more money that way. Yeah. So maybe, maybe clarify how many territories you have and kind of what, what geography that covers. Yeah. So I have four territories, um, three of which are uh, in, in kind of like a core area where, where I live. And then one territory is um, off uh, on a really big island called Vancouver Island. Um, it's about four hours away from me. Uh, and yeah, uh, but basically most of my business does come from these three, three key territories because it is, um, you know, more of a metropolitan type area. Uh, but nonetheless, the potential with the island is, is there as well. And Joseph, did you start out with um, the four territories? Good question. No, I did not. Uh, I just started with where, where I was, where I was living, and slowly expanded out. So I think when I started up Vancouver Island, I think it was um, April of 2015. So it was probably almost almost a year before I started that one up. Okay. So you started yeah, with I didn't, yeah. the three and then went from there. Yeah, I didn't want to stretch myself too thin. I want to get a good sense of what trade shows were all about, all those things. I want to understand the, the process as far as, you know, the, the whole sales to, um, the sale to in installation and um, where where the shipments were going to go, all those things. I wanted to be adept at that first before I was ready to set up another. Because once you have to go to another territory that's so far away, you're basically starting up a new business. And you have to have that system kind of in place as well. Okay. Makes sense. Those are great questions. Um, and so if there's not any other questions right now, I'll see maybe Joseph, if you can talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of what your marketing strategy has been since you opened, you've referenced trade shows a couple of times. Uh, so maybe talk about, you know, how that's been a, a part of your strategy. And also, you know, you, you've mentioned, you know, kind of your role as the owner be getting to be getting out in the market and you've joined the Chamber of Commerce and some of these other things. And, you know, that's always something that we, you know, recommend to, to new franchise partners to start on immediately is kind of the, the networking aspect of it. But, you know, as you know, some of those things, you know, take a little while to really get some traction in terms of, you know, generating steady referrals. So uh, I think one of the questions a lot of people have is, you know, how am I going to get through that first three to six months to that, that first year of trying to ramp this business up? So uh, maybe start by talking a little bit about what your marketing strategy was to, to get you through that ramp up period and then maybe how it's kind of evolved over time. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I'll start with the, you know, the, the whole aspect of networking. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you, you know, face to face is very key as far as um, building relationships. And when you get to know people, uh, especially the, the ones that you think can refer you business, not asking for the business, but you know, it's more give and take, right? I mean, I'm, I, I am a person that loves giving out and it just so happens this past, this year, we were nominated for the community spirit award for the chamber of commerce. Uh, oh, we were awesome. in the top three. Yeah, we were, there were seven nominees. Uh, we were one of them and then we got into the top three, uh, but we were going up against a legend, like the, you know, like the, um, the Babe Ruth of, um, of community spirit uh, and you know there was no doubt he was going to win it so but anyways it was an honor to be a part of it and I think uh, it, it has to do with the years that yeah I, I, I do a lot of I do community stuff I, I don't ask for the recognition didn't even expect it I don't even know who nominated me but it was really nice that I was got nominated but I think when you do those things that are very authentic and people know that they want to do business with you over time maybe not be today it can be three years from now, but you build it now so that when people know you and they think the time is right, they, they will, they will knock on your door. Uh, that, again, that's my belief system. That's my own philosophy. Um, from a market, from another marketing point of view. Yeah, definitely out here, out West here in Vancouver, uh, trade shows definitely work. Uh, it's not just home shows. Um, my belief with trade shows is more about, um, 
you know, where is your target market? Will your target market be at those trade shows? So I think beyond home shows. Uh, so we've done women's shows, we've done Christmas shows, uh, we've done um, all these various uh, community shows, uh, business community shows, um, uh, street festivals. So you just try to find ways to get the brand out there. And whether you, whether you get business or not necessarily, um, you know, it, you're crossing your fingers uh, that people will show up, but it definitely spreading the brand out there. And one of the questions I ask all the time at trade shows, and I teach my team that is, have you heard of us? Because that's a nice litmus test as far as where your brand really is at. If every single person that you meet says no, you're probably not doing your marketing well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so uh, that's, that's first thing was trade shows, booking them up trying it out even if even if they're a flop hey you know what you learned your lesson and let's do let's 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 not do that again yeah. um and then the other one is at that time five years ago newspapers so we were doing that once a week and uh and i'll be honest with newspapers as you probably know with technology um you know it, it, it may or, or may not work in, in some areas and and so you know you start seeing some of those results but you got to try these things out to really see where where it's at um, and so these are all different marketing funnels. And, and the third one for me was um, social media. So uh, immediately set up a Facebook page. Uh, and one of my goals was to, you know, have uh, over at that time was let's get 100 likes on Facebook, right? Liking our page. And yep. so that when I'm advertising or when I'm posting something, at least I have an audience that can see in my post, right? Uh, and, and so every single email that we send out to our clients encourages them to go to our Facebook page and click like uh, and now we have close to 2100 likes on our Facebook That's and awesome. again it's not a popularity contest but again it's about creating an audience so that those people might be able to share they're your fans they might be able to share what you're posting to their audience their friends their family uh, and, and so you know you have to I think you have to learn to build advocates that will spread the word of what we do and whether it's a really uh, amazing picture of something that will make someone do or share, you know, like a call to action. Uh, you know, so, so social media is going to be very, very important, I think, in, in our business, because the more people can see what we do, the more they can visualize and um, see what it can look like in their own homes. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. another avenue. And then the other one, I think, um, yeah, is, is important is, yeah, is just getting out there, just being deliberate and just getting out there. Don't be at home all the time, right? Yeah. Park your, you know, uh, wrapped car at a community, at some rec center community where uh, a bunch of seniors might be coming out at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, and see what that looks like, right? And, and see whether that starts a conversation. Well, and, and that's, a, I think, a really, several really good points that you make there. But in terms of, you know, not just limiting yourself to, to doing home shows, because I think that's, you know, for some owners, maybe a bit of a misconception where, you know, hey, there's these other events or shows, but they're not attendees coming out specifically to look for ways that they can improve their home or, or something of that nature. And, and I think that's a, a bad filter to run those type of events through because we're fortunate in that we have a very eye-catching type of solution. And it's the type of thing that most people that own a home would see the value in whether they come to an event specifically looking for custom glide out shelving or ways that they can better organize their kitchen or pantry. When they see it, something kind of clicks with them and they, they usually are going to want to come over and talk to you about it and learn more. And I know we've seen that firsthand in our market and, and we're really getting more aggressive in trying, you know, different shows that at first glance may not seem like they make a whole lot of sense. And the coolest right. thing about it is you can find some, uh, I think Sharon's heard me say this. I call them the the diamonds in the rough, where it's like, you know, it's a very inexpensive little event to do. And, and on paper, it may not look like it makes a whole lot of sense. But even from that, in addition to the exposure that you're getting, if you can book one, two, three appointments from it, you know, a, a metric we all look at pretty closely is our cost per appointment. And you can get some really good cost per appointments from some of these smaller type shows. And if you have enough of them going on, it can really become a, a, a you know, valuable, you know, marketing tool for you. Um, so I think that was a, a good point that you hit on. And, and I would certainly echo everything that you've said when it comes to networking. I mean, you know, our business is no different than most referrals are gold. So, 
you know, as an owner, whatever you can do to, to stir up as much referral activity as possible, that's a fantastic use of your time. Um, so I think those right. are all really, really valid points that you make. Yeah. And, and just one more point, Wes, with just with trade shows, I've developed a lot of relationships, even with trade show exhibitors. And, and the reason why I do that yes. is because not just with networking, but just when you develop relations with these trade show folks, I mean, you're kind of like a band of brothers or sisters uh, going trade show to trade show and get to know them. And uh, the other part that's helpful is you can ask for help with them. You know, what are what other trade shows are you doing? Yep. Um, I'm looking for a trade show person. Do you know anybody that, cause they've seen our booth. So, you know, can you bring somebody by to our booth that you might know that might be a good fit to help at the trade shows or be a designer? Again, you know, they are your resources, I think. Um, and so what I do deliberately is I sometimes will go a couple hours before the show's over, which is usually when it starts to slow down or yep. a couple hours before it, or, uh, when it starts and have a conversation, just say hi, you know, and, and if you can think of one or two things that you might be looking for and just drop a, drop a seed in their head in terms of, you know, what you're, what you're looking for. Um, imagine how quick you can get things done because there's other people that can help you out that way. That's a great point. Yeah. Really, really good point. Um, well, that's awesome. So, you know, I would, I would venture to say that, you know, over the last five years, your, your marketing strategy has evolved a little bit and, and, you know, I guess I'm referring more towards kind of your, your paid marketing and advertising. So I would assume you have kind of a monthly budget that you've allocated towards different marketing and advertising vehicles. So maybe talk a little bit about what that looks like today. Where are some of the places that you're spending your marketing dollars and, and maybe where are you seeing some of the, the best ROI right now on that marketing spend? Sure. Um, you know, in our world, definitely, I think trade shows is still, um, I, I wouldn't say it represents even half our business at this point. I think it used to be a little bit higher, but, um, but definitely trade shows, no doubt when people touch, like you mentioned, Wes, about seeing our, our trade show booth and again, getting that visual about what's possible, seeing the quality of the work that we have um, on display uh, really allows them to um, take action as far as, hey, I really want to see what you can do with my house or my boat. You know, we've done boat, uh, you know, RV shows, we've done boat shows, you know, a lot of these different shows. Again, uh, it's not about necessarily the boat or the RV, it's about what they can own. Um, right. And then as far as other marketing vehicles, um, yeah, I've done, I've been doing more direct marketing of late, uh, trying different avenues. Uh, mm -hmm. Some didn't work well as other, but again, you got to, it's marketing like anything. It, it doesn't have to be shelf genie, but it can be any type of business. You have to just try to get your name out there. Uh, and you have to test it out. So direct marketing where you have a little flip book, um, like a, a um, I, don't, I don't know what you have down there, but whatever a little flip book that you've seen, coupon books or whatever, you know. Yeah, like, like a been, Val pack or a money mail. Val pack. Yeah. yeah, so I don't have Val pack up here, but but certainly like a Val pack of the world. Um, you know, I, this is funny enough. This is the first time I'm actually doing it this year. Like I'm finally looking at different avenues because I've been trying all these other ones out and I'm starting to notice the uh the structure of the the marketing uh you know you can see some of the results not working as well so yep. things like newspaper for me um it, it was working amazingly great roi and you can start seeing some of the results so you have to really shift around the marketing because of technology the way it's in our world now you really have to get a good sense of when to i would say call it quits but maybe sp slow down on your marketing on certain fronts and start accelerating on other fronts yep Yep. And, and so maybe, maybe speak a little bit to some of the tools that you have available to you to track some of that and, and be able to really gauge how, how your marketing is performing for you. Yeah. The, um, I mean, that, that, that's, what's cool. I think about the system that shelf genie has built is yeah. The, uh, the ROI report, um, where we can track, you know, um, where all the leads are coming from, how many appointments that were generated, how many sales that we got from that. And then obviously all the, um, all the math as far as ROI, average uh, cost, um, revenue per appointment, all these key metrics that we need to know to run a business properly are all there. I think that's pretty awesome. And the fact that we can easily change the date range to understand how we do every single year, yep. uh, I think helps uh, us, again, make proper business decisions. And I think that's the key word is having reports that will make us uh, be successful making good business decisions. Yeah. And that is one of many reports that's in that system. There's a lot of, I, there's reports in Wish Portal that, that I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't even gone in and, and explored all of the reporting that's available to me. There's, there's so much there. Um, 
So no, no shortage of information when it comes to knowing your numbers. Yeah. So, um, if there's a, um, the, I believe it was in March, you started with a new, um, digital marketing partner. Are you, am I? Yes. Um, yes. so how would, given you, you were doing something before and then that changed, how would you, um, have you, have you been using it long enough to see a change and, and, and what would you, yep. how would you rate yeah, that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. It's just been a month so far. Uh, I just, it just so happens I had my uh, third call with that company um, just a few days ago. And, and, and the cool thing about that company is that they have a dashboard, um, uh, which we really didn't have a good handle on in the past. Uh, yep. this, this company is, is very good as far as, you know, showing you the results. Again, same, very similar to Shelf Genie system. Uh, it gives you a very good illustration as far as, you know, from Google to Bing to Facebook. Uh, and they're uh, setting up a Yelp account for me, which I didn't have before. They're doing these things that I didn't ask for, they're doing it. And, you, and the cool thing is that you pay a flat rate, right? Uh, versus as a percentage in the past. And I think that's very key in our world uh, as owners is that, you know, you can control, you know what your costs are. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, you, you definitely have a company that is franchise focused. That's a lot of their, their base is uh, franchise companies. Um, and like I said, I'm a, you know, I'm a data nerd myself. I love seeing data. So I, I, it's very cool to see all this information uh, at the, my fingertips. And then I've asked a lot of questions along the way and they've been able to uh, answer them for me. I think it's been, they've been very responsive. So uh, I've been impressed so far with um, um, Kigo, the company uh, that we're using. Uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's been good so far. But you know, like I said, with any type of marketing, uh, especially with the new company, it just takes time for the, the digital side to really take off it takes a few months uh, to really get going. But so far I've seen pretty good results. Yeah. And so they, they actually came in, uh, Kigo came in and, and met with us this week uh, for the join the team day. So Sharon got to, to meet and, and talk to them a little bit, but um, I, I agree with you. The, the flat rate that we now have in place with them is, is good. Not only so you kind of know what your costs are a little bit better, but also, you know, when, they may make a recommendation to say, hey, I'd recommend increasing your budget in this area. Right. It kind of takes out the question mark of, okay, well, do you really recommend that? Or are you just trying to increase the, the rate that I'm paying you because it's in the past been variable with your spend? Exactly. Um, so I think that's a, a nice aspect of it as well. And, um, you know, to, to kind of briefly circle back to one of the things you mentioned earlier about social and how important that is, you know, they kept commenting when we were there, they were like, your product was made for advertising on social media. It's just got such a good, you know, kind of visual and aesthetic uh, component to it. It's, it's completely ideal for, you know, ads on Facebook and Instagram and not even just ads, but anything organic that you're putting up there as well. Um, right. So that was, that was kind of cool to hear. Yeah. And speaking of Instagram, I mean, I have an Instagram account and, you know, my, my handle is called, you know, cabinet whisperer. Uh, yeah. and, and although Instagram is, is, uh, is, is considered as a millennial tool. Um, but you know, certainly there are people like I'm turning 44, um, next month, uh, and even beyond, um, there are more and more people my age or even older also jumping on Instagram as well. Uh, and, um, the way I frame, my ads on Instagram is more towards, you know, will this help your parents? Will this help your grandparents? And it's a different way of marketing, of course, but again, it's just for them to pass on the word about what we do. But the audience is very large uh, as far as Instagram users. It's more about how we articulate it to get them to pass on the word for us. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll, I'll say we, we started running Instagram ads shortly after we opened our franchise and and I kid you not the very first appointment that we booked through an Instagram ad was a young lady in her 80s um which we were shocked because we were you know not expecting you know that that uh kind of elderly of a demographic to find us on Instagram but but sure enough so um you know I don't know if that was an anomaly or not but it was uh it was interesting to see um yeah. and so. over time more and more people will be Jumping on Instagram, uh, again, you know, it's, again, it's just, and, and the key thing about marketing, if there's any good takeaway from this, is, is, is always about how do we get in front of people? So if less and less people are reading the newspaper, for example, what are they doing, 
right? You ask those questions. And then if you say that, okay, well, if they're jumping on certain bandwagons of social media, again, how do we get in front of them? So always ask that question so that we don't just throw it down like a roulette table with chips and hoping that it'll work. You know, yeah. it, it's good to kind of have those questions in your head before you put down those chips. Yeah. And I think you do have to get comfortable trying new things. I mean, especially in the, the day and age that, that we're operating in now. I mean, it's just constantly evolving and, and you just have to get comfortable trying new things. And, and you want to go into something new as, as educated as you can and, and feel as confident as possible that it's going to be a good way to get in front of people. But, uh, you know, you're, you're likely to encounter some, some uh, failures along the way. But uh, I think if you just kind of get stuck in what's worked in the past, you know, you're likely to miss some really good opportunities in the process. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been great. So we've got about five minutes or so left. I, I told Joseph we'd try to keep this to right at an hour. So um, any other questions for Joseph before we kind of wrap things up here today? No, I appreciate all his um, candor and, and sharing with us. That's great. And congratulations, Joseph, on your success. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, this has been great. I mean, tons of good information here. And, and I mean, we could go for another hour or two easily, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. So maybe just in closing, you know, what, what advice would you give, Joseph, to someone that's, that's going through this process right now and, and evaluating Shelf Genie and, and not even just Shelf Genie, but just kind of evaluating the prospect of, of getting into business for themselves uh, you know, what advice would you give to them as they go through their due diligence? And then maybe also if they do decide to get into business for themselves, what advice would you have for a, a brand new business owner? Absolutely. I mean, I was in your shoes. I mean, I was in the corporate world, um, you know, uh, going through, you know, getting a paycheck, getting a good paycheck, um, but again, didn't love what I did. So if, if there was anything, um, you know, we all have butterflies and making decisions and, when, you know, signing on the dotted line and, and going into the unknown. I think we all go through that. But I think trusting your instincts as far as if you think that you will enjoy what you're going to do will certainly help. Do not think about the dollar amount that you're going to make, although that will help. But think about how you're going to make this into something very successful uh, and make sure to have enough capital up front to get your marketing up and running and have a plan in place so that, you know, and I think this is the best time in my opinion to buy a franchise around this time for our business anyways, because you get to plan everything out so that when you go into trade show season in the fall, you'll have everything ready with the team in place. Yeah. And then go right into trade show season into the winter and spring. Uh, it's a great cycle in my opinion. Um, and uh, definitely ask for help. Don't gamble on things that you think may or may not work. Definitely ask for help in terms of guiding you in terms of making some good business decisions up front. Because if you get burnt um, quickly up front, you're going to be running out of cash very fast. Yep. So definitely ask for that help first, seeing what other people are doing, and then make the best business decision from that. Great. Thank you. Good advice. Yeah, very good advice. I, I read a quote the other day, and I'm, I'm probably going to butcher it, but it was something along the lines of, you know, most people think it's the unknown that we fear, but what people really fear is losing the known. Uh, and I think that's kind of relevant to, to what we're talking about, you know, right, right now, because you're definitely, you know, jumping into the unknown, whether it's Shelf Genie or any other business that, that you start. Um, and so I think it's just kind of getting comfortable being uncomfortable and, and, I'll echo your point is, you know, raise your hand and ask for help if you need it. I think, you know, one of the most valuable things about joining a franchise organization, if it's a strong franchise system, you know, in addition to the training and the support that you should be getting from the, the home office, it's, you know, leveraging the peer network that you have of the other franchise owners that have been in business for, you know, longer than you have at that point and really tapping into that and taking advantage of, you know, the knowledge that they have and, and also taking advantage of the mistakes that they've made along the way so that you can, yes. you know, avoid making some of the same mistakes. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, hey, this has been awesome. Thanks again, Joseph. I really appreciate it. Always good chatting with you, man. Um, last question for you, not to put you on the spot, but um, I always like to ask, what book are you reading right now? If, if you're a reader? Uh, yeah, well, um, I, I, I listen to audiobooks in the car a lot. Um, I'm reading this, I'm listening to this one called You're a Badass. Yep. I've read it. Yeah. 
Yeah. If, if, if you have a chance to listen to the audiobook, the author is just amazing. Uh, I can just see how that very, would be good to listen to the author actually reading it. Uh, I can see how yeah, that would I highly recommend that book. Part. It's very motivating, especially for my wife. She's, she's, she's listened to that twice now. Yeah. Um, and I'm listening to it the first time. Um, I just started that last month and it's, it's, it's been great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. I read it several years ago, so it's probably good to, to go back and revisit. But hey, with that, my friend, you are a badass, and uh, I appreciate your time. Hope everybody has a great Friday and a, a great weekend. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Take weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.